time. Okay, I guess we'll we'll get started. I'm just going to introduce the um, session chairs for the next um, session, which is Vivek Bala from Stanford and Anubhav Chakraborty from KU. So I'll let you guys uh, take it up, take it from here. Thank you. Anubhav, you want to go ahead? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Watnick. Uh, Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, welcome to the second session. I'm really excited to uh, moderate this with Dr. Bhalla. Uh, is Dr. Lake on the screen? Oh, yes, I am. Oh, yep. wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, to start off, uh, the first speaker of this session would be uh, Dr. Angela Leck. Uh, she is the Vice President of Research at the Muscular Dystrophy Association, which is a voluntary health organization at the, in the United States. Uh, she is a PhD trained scientist who has worked on disease modeling and therapy development for muscular dystrophies. Her current position involves working with uh, stakeholders to achieve translation of genetic therapies. She also serves as a scientific lead for Muscular Dystrophy Association's in-house gene therapy development program for ultra-rare neuromuscular dis disorders, excuse me. Uh, the title of her talk is Learning from Neuromuscular Disease uh, in Gene Therapies. Over to you, Dr. Lake. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers for um, inviting me to this uh, symposium. And I was asked today to uh, give give a high level overview of um, uh, the state of gene therapies um, and also learnings from the neuromuscular disease field that may hopefully um, be helpful or, or inspiring to to the PKD field. So let me begin. So for those of you who don't know MDA, um, Muscular Dystrophy Association, we're the number one voluntary health organization um, supporting and advocating um, uh, patients with neuromuscular diseases. Uh, we've been around for over 70 years and um, second only to the US government, we are the largest funders of, of research and, and, and development uh, in, in this area. So, um, there is much excitement um, around uh, uh, gene therapies, both in the patient and the research community, um, because clinical trials show a promise technology to treat the root cause of mon monogenic uh, disorders. But having said that, we are really still in our infancy, particularly um, with respect to um, the clinical translation and um, fully realizing the potential of this technology, which I'll expand upon in, in my talk. This is a brief um, uh, high level overview of the clinical translation of, of gene therapies. As you can see, the um, uh, technology really has been around for a long time with the first attempts using retroviruses actually performed in uh, the 1980s and then used to, to treat ADA deficiency. Um, the field subsequently transitioned to, whoops, to, um, uh, using uh, adenoviruses. And unfortunately, this led to uh, the death of, of a patient, uh, Jesse Gelsinger, which uh, subsequently stalled the, the field for about 10 years, actually not much happened. And it wasn't un uh, until the early 2010s when the field started to pick up again. Um, and uh, this time actually using uh, adeno uh, associated viruses. And you can see the uptick in approval of, of gene therapies, which is thought to uh, rise exponentially and ex um, in, in the next few years. So this is a, 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 what it looks like in the 2020, uh, 2017 uh, landscape of the companies that are working in gene therapy. So on the outside here, you have all the different disease indications. And as you, um, the different segments of the circle represent the different phases of drug development. I just want you to keep this uh, as a snapshot in your mind while I transition to the next slide, which is the 2022 picture of the landscape. You can see um, a vast difference now. The field is a lot more populated um, with uh, an increase in companies being involved across all indications, the most of most of them being still in the phase one, phase two, or preclinical development. But you can also see a lot of uh, uh, now uh, uh, an increase in the number of approved and marketed uh, gene therapies in the field. So in terms of absolute values, as of quarter two, 2023, um, a sideline reported an HGCT uh, about 20, uh, 2,000 um, 
and gene therapy development efforts um, across the spectrum of, of uh, preclinical to the different phases of development. The majority of these um, are related to uh, oncology indications, um, second, uh, seconded by um, the rare diseases. And in, within rare diseases themselves, the majority are actually uh, rare oncological indications with um, the rest of the 46% being things such as ALS, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, and, and other diseases. So uh, when I when I talk about uh, um, gene therapy, the most mature of these uh, technologies involves uh, gene replacement therapy, or otherwise known as gene transfer, where you're essentially replacing the defective or, or missing gene, um, and you're giving them a healthy copy of the gene. But um, there is also gene editing, which involves um, delivering the machinery to correct um, the the defective gene and to revert mutations back to its to its wild type sequence. And this is um, rapidly going into trials and gaining approval. There is also gene silencing uh, efforts, usually to to treat uh, autosomal dominance or, or silence um, diseases with gain of function mutations. So um, the leading modality, at least for our field for neuromuscular diseases, is using adeno-associated viruses. Um, and uh, this has shown a lot of promise in the clinic where you're essentially packaging your therapeutic constructs in, in, in the, the virus particles, which then go on to infect the target tissue, which in our case is muscle, sometimes cardiac or, or central nervous system. Um, where it can then um, uh, drop its payload, its genetic payload, um, and this, this strand of DNA is maintained as an episome, uh, which is a circularized piece of DNA and can be likened to an extra chromosome that exists for a very long time inside, um, inside uh, cells or tissue. And um, the, the, this product. So there are many different AV um, subtypes, otherwise known as serotypes, um, that have been found in nature. Um, and uh, they have different tissue tropism. Um, uh, and this can be, the different tissue tropism can be leveraged uh, for therapeutic development for tissue specific expression. So the one that's most common, commonly used in our field uh, that targets skeletal muscle and heart is AEV9 and AEV8, but it might be different for your field. And there is also now um, the emergence of like uh, artificially designed um, AEV serotypes to increase, to have more specific tissue tropism. So um, there are many candidates um, and neuro, monogenic neuromuscular uh, disorders are actually prime targets for gene therapies. So for muscle diseases, Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, is a common form of muscular dystrophy and is a prime target um, where uh, uh, the defective gene is the dystrophin gene, which is a, um, a shock absorber, acts as a shock absorber in the in muscle tissue. And, and if when this is compromised, you get um, uh, you get weakening of the muscle cell membrane and muscle cell death. For neurological disorders, spinal muscular atrophy is a prime target for gene therapy, and is caused by um, and defective or deficient uh, SMN1 gene, which, which is crucial for um, the survival of motor neurons. So um, recently, um, we've had two uh, FDA approvals um, for uh, gene replacement therapy via AEV in our field, Zolgensma for uh, spinal muscular atrophy and Elevidus for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is designed as a one-time gene replacement um, therapy with a very hefty price tag, as you can see. Um, but uh, it's it's shown a lot of promise, at least uh, for Zelgensma. Elevidus was recently, only recently approved. So there is a, a lot of um, post-marketing uh, surveillance and, and studies um, uh, uh, planned for this before we can see how well um, uh, it, it, it modifies the disease progression. In terms of Zolgensma, um, as I mentioned, it's a gene replacement therapy for SMA, um, where you have mutations in the SMN1 gene, which uh, uh, it produces insufficient uh, protein levels of the SMN1 gene and leads to the death of motor neurons. Um, 
So uh, the SMN1 gene um, fortunately fits into a single AEV and is delivered via the AEV9 uh, capset to target the central nervous system in an attempt to restore the expression of, of SMN1 um, into uh, into the motor neurons. Um, Zolgensma has been around for uh, quite a few years now, and it, um, thanks to newborn screening across in America, infants uh, diagnosed with um, SMN, uh, SMA type 1 um, rapidly have access to Zolgensma, which drastically alters the disease progression, allowing them to live past the age of 1 and, and achieve um, significant motor milestones that, that, um, that uh, normally is not associated with this disease. So for dystrophin, um, this is a, a little bit different because the dystrophin gene is the biggest gene in the human genome. It contains 79 exons, so it doesn't fit into a single AEV. This is can be likened to the scenario of, of PC1. So many um, decades have actually gone into research to look at which of the exons or the, the functional domains of dystrophin confer the most um, function. Uh, to, to the protein. And if we were to create a truncated or a mini dystrophin, which of these um, exons is most important to include? There are four um, companies in the space now, and each have a slightly different um, selection of which, which exons they believe is important to confer the, functional, um, the function of, of dystrophin in the muscle. There is also next generation technology um, that is being with um, a lot of promise in the field. This is using split in team technologies to deliver, um, to allow delivery of larger proteins. So split in teams um, covalently co covalently joined uh, two protein fragments in vivo. So um, yeah, the end terminal is, is fused to the end terminal of a protein and the other half of the protein is um, fused to the C terminal uh, in team. And in vivo, they can come together they can ligate, and then um, with the intein being spliced out. So how this works practically is you deliver two halves of the protein um, uh, using two AAVs, and then um, when the product, the transgene, is uh, is translated, the inteins can combine and um, uh, be excised. And then um, the result is that you get a, a larger um, a protein fragments. Um, so in this case, um, these slides were provided by Dr. Ch Jeff Jeffrey Chamberlain, um, who has now successfully expressed um, a larger dystrophin, uh, which is called uh, midi dystrophin, than what has called mini dystrophin, um, that it now confers a lot more function than, than the micro dystrophin constructs that are being tested in the clinic. So some unknowns and concerns of one-time gene therapy treatments, there is really large variability in clinical outcomes of treated patients uh, with Zolgensma and Elevitas. Um, and we don't yet fully understand why that is. Um, and it appears that the window of benefit uh, is determined by the patient's age or the disease progression. So those at a more advanced stage of the disease isn't predicted, they're not predicted to, to um, uh, have as much benefit by the, by the therapy, given how much fibrosis and muscle damage that has already happened. The duration and longevity of the benefit of gene therapy is, is still also in question. And I think this is going to differ from disease to disease. And it's not going to be um, very reflective by the studies we've done in animals. There is also the concern of when you treat a child with gene therapy, as the child grows and the tissue grows, that the vector will be diluted over time. Um, and this is anticipated to cause a fading treatment effect. Um, there is also um, uh, safety issues that limit the vector dose. Um, the higher you go, um, the more chance of experiencing an adverse event. And also currently, uh, redosing of AAV gene therapies is not feasible because, um, in effect, you're, you're immunizing yourself against, against the AAV um, a therapy uh, upon treatment, which, which prevents you from, from getting uh, additional rounds of um, uh, uh, dosing, even when the treatment fades. But a lot of research is going into um, looking at how to, how to uh, perform redosing safely. 
So um, there has been um, safety issues um, that have come to the forefront uh, uh, linked to several deaths associated with gene therapies across many trials, many different diseases, many different factors. Um, and these deaths are largely caused by uh, immune toxic responses to the vector itself, to AEV. And the, as a field, we're only beginning to understand the role of you know, pre-existing immunity and having neutralizing antibodies to AEVs um, that the body may have seen um, to uh, AV particles in the wild and then how they then respond to the treatment because of this. There's also um, the role of the innate immune response um, that occurs days post-dosing and is typically triggered by the viral capsid or the transgene cassette. And there is uh, the role of the adaptive immune response that typically occurs weeks post-dosing and is triggered by the transgene product. So we are beginning to understand um, the role of these different types of immune responses and proactively um, uh, uh, um, being on top of them and, 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 and deploying risk mitigation strategies. So um, immune-related adverse events is, is common across all clinical trials, I have to say, um, with um, all diseases or different kinds of vectors and, and, and cargo. Um, they range from you know, moderates, such as, you know, um, from geopathy, um, kidney injury to, you know, really severe, such as, you know, um, uh, myocarditis and, and death. Um, and this is, this is something that you know, we're only, as I said, beginning to understand. And it seems like the risk of this is exacerbated by some pre-existing underlying conditions that are um, a, a, a linked to different diseases and also linked to how high the dose is. So anything above 10 to the 14 is, I would say, definitely, it's, it's a sure thing that you're going to have an adverse event of some sort, whether it's mild or severe. Um, and uh, so a lot of research is going into that right now in the field. So um, another uh, category of, of, of um, immune responses that have really come to light is this issue of transgene, having an immune response to the transgene itself that you're deli uh, delivering. And this has been observed across um, different D uh, DMD clinical trials that use different constructs, different promoters, different capsids. And it uh, was linked to uh, really uh, uh, severe forms of, of myositis and myocarditis, um, requiring some requiring um, ventilator support, which is very serious. Um, what was discovered actually was that these patients that suffered these this, um, uh, these symptoms all had a similar uh, a pathogenic mutation that occurred in a region of dystrophin that um, was common in um, all the therapeutic constructs delivered. Um, so meaning that they had, sorry, not pathogenic mutations, had deletions. So the body had never seen these regions in the therapeutic construct. And um, the immune response therefore saw it as a non-self epitope and, and um, reacted to it immunogenically. So this is something that needs to be considered going forward. And anti-transgene responses are going to be more common, particularly in uh, crim uh, negative patients um, across various uh, gene therapy trials. So in terms of safety, um, variable responses have been observed uh, within the same and across different trials, and they continue to be a source of investigation. Um, safety is really impacted by many things, including disease features, patient size, AV properties, dose, target organs. Um, we're looking at the role of genetic predisposition to immune responses. Um, <laughs> And um, we are discovering that animal models in our field cannot predict the full spectrum of adverse events we're seeing in humans. And the risk benefit calculation for gene therapy for each patient is going to be unique um, and is going to require input from clinicians, patients and caregivers. So in terms of considerations for gene therapy in PKD, um, the things to think about is what is it gene replacement where you're um, selecting only the most functional domains to, to replace? Or is it um, using a split intent technology to maybe try and attempt to deliver and, and recombine the, the entire uh, gene in vivo? Or is it um, gene correction using using CRISPR um, to, to, to go in there and, and, and fix the, the mutations? Or is it targeting... Um, 
the upregulation or downregulation of genetic modifiers? Do you have the appropriate um, cell models to demonstrate proof of concept? Um, and animal models to demonstrate um, the efficacy and, and, and the appropriate clinical dose. And also animal models to model the safety and toxicity, given that um, uh, AV uh, delivery has been linked to, to also kidney toxicity in several indications. Will you deliver it systemically or localized and, and also viral versus non-viral? So um, I, I just want to say that... Um, we are, um, I'll just end off quickly saying that we have an internal um, uh, in-house uh, gene therapy drug development for ultra rare diseases that are amenable to gene therapy. And, and the um, idea here is to, um, to de-risk indications and, and, and allow ID um, and to essentially um, uh, uh, make sure that ultra rare diseases that are not commercially viable get to um, experience the benefits of, of gene therapy without being lagged behind because just because there are not enough patients having this, this disease to make them commercially viable. We have a plan for that. Um, and uh, um, sorry, I have to cut this short, but um, the idea is that we, uh, we are going to develop resources and documentations and essentially a blueprint to help um, uh, non other nonprofits participate and be risk early stages of drug development um, and, and as to essentially then um, make them as attractive um, a, a, an investment um, as they can be at later stages of the development um, for for um, commercial partners to then jump in and 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 take over the manufacturing and mass producing and 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 um, clinical trials for the drug development. Okay, with that, I just want to say thank you. And um, you can email me here if you have any further questions. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Leg. That was wonderful. Uh, let me start off this uh, Q&A discussion with uh, a question of my own. So um, what was interesting in your talk was uh, the sheer enormous cost of uh, gene therapy, it goes in millions of dollars. Do you think that's a huge bottleneck that the field needs to overcome? Yeah, they are. It, it is reducing um, now. And uh, but it seems like, you know, the majority once it is approved, the majority of, of health insurance are willing to cover that. And I think due to the health economics in the U.S., um, it is the hefty price tag um, it, it, it works here. I mean, the, the reimbursement works, but in other countries, um, such as, you know, Europe or with um, uh, universal health care, um, it, it, it may not, the, the big price tag may not be so uh, amenable to being covered um, in a lot of different countries. I don't see a question in the chat box yet. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, there is a question uh, related to the intain approach. So with the intain approach, is it limited to two fragments and is there any evidence of dominant negative effects? Yeah. So no, it is not. Um, I believe that the, the Chamberlain Lab at University of Washington have experimented with delivering the entire dystrophin gene across three different um, intain uh, fragments. Is there, so far, no, it's um, no, no effect as far as I'm concerned of dominant negative, no. Uh, so the next question is, what proportion of your target, that is muscle cells, do you think need to be transduced to achieve clinical benefit? <laughs> that is always, that is the question. That really is the question um, that is, uh, everyone's been asking and also not just transduced, but to what level? Um, and we can try to determine this um, in, in animal studies, but sometimes it doesn't translate to, to the patient because especially in the patient, the, um, as the disease progresses, typically um, and you get, say, loss of, of, of muscle tissue, it's replaced by fat, it's replaced by scar tissue, fibrotic tissue. So it's really hard to, to, to gauge how much is needed. It, it depends also on... Um, on many factors. So um, typically we like to set, uh, aim for every every muscle fiber, for example, to be transduced. Um, but then also it, it also um, you need to take into account how strong your promoter is and, and how much of the transgene is going to be expressed. So it's not just a proportion of 
yeah, the many other things need to be taken into account in terms of which need to be determined experimentally. It's not just percentage of transduction. Uh, do you think immunosuppression? Yes, they are. They currently are being used. Um, steroids um, are, are being used um, prophylactically. Also, you know, um, rapamycin and different immunosuppression is 100% used, but sometimes it still doesn't um, avoid the adverse events. I have one more question. How did they determine the minimal region of the gene needed to rescue? That would be tough using mouse models. It is tough. It is tough. They they determine it by, by having um, uh, assays, um, appropriate assays that reflect the function of the protein in the muscle such as muscle force readouts, interactions with other proteins, um, targeting to the to the right, um, to where it's supposed to be in the cell. Um, as I said, I mentioned um, over a decade of research was done into the basic science to determine exactly which parts are needed. Uh, so next question is, how many individuals participate in these clinical trials? It depends on the disease. For for DMD, I believe over 300 uh, patients have been treated across um, a, 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 for with gene therapy across uh, all the all the different trials. But you know there um, uh, there are other rare diseases that you know there's only 20 people. There sometimes there's only one. Um, so it, 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 it all depends on how you structure the trial and your conversations with the FDA to see what they exactly uh, want. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Leg. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, and we'll now move to the next speaker. Uh, thank you so much. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Jason Tilsdale. Uh, Dr. Tilsdale is the branch chief uh, for the Cellular and Molecular Therapeutics Branch. And he also serves as the director of the Trans-NIH Intramural Sickle Cell Program at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. Tilsdale's work uh, centers on sickle cell disease, specifically developing curative strategies uh, for sickle cell disease through transplantation of allogenic or genetically modified autologous bone marrow stem cells. The title of his talk is The Long and Winding Road to Molecular Cures for the First Molecular Disease. Over to you, Dr. Tisdale. Uh, thank you. Um, it's great to have an opportunity to share our experience with uh, gene therapy in sickle cell disease. And I hope to convince you that it's time to envision broadly available cures with an S underlined here, because I think we have multiple genetic ways of now approaching this disease. Uh, and it's about time. <clears throat> It's been over a century uh, since the disease was described in a, in a dental student in the West Indies, um, showing this particular peripheral blood film with red cells assuming a sickle shape. Uh, and this patient was presenting with, with recurrent severe pain. Uh, and it indeed is the first molecular disease described by Linus Pauling uh, in 1949 uh, based on the hemoglobin uh, molecule. And it results from a single substitution of position six of the beta globin chain. This results in an abnormal hemoglobin that's prone to polymerization upon deoxygenation, causing severe anemia, frequent severe pain with the destruction of the, of the blood vessels and end organ damage and early mortality. Uh, it's a rare disease in the US, about 100,000, uh, but it's not a rare disease in the world. There are many millions in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. And we only have you know, a few uh, supportive uh, therapies that are FDA approved at the moment. So we really do need uh, clinical trials testing uh, curative approaches. The disease affects every organ from, from head to toe. And as I mentioned, causes early mortality, but with, with um, universal newborn screening and penicillin prophylaxis and pneumococcal vaccination to protect against uh, overwhelming infections with encapsulated organisms. This death rate of about 25% in kids shown in yellow here in the 70s has largely been eliminated by these simple measures. But deaths in the 30s and 40s still remains uh, quite common. And even in the modern era, the mean age of death is, is around uh, 40. So we really do need curative therapies. Well, there is a cure uh, for sickle cell disease. And uh, this is uh, what I would call whole genome therapy, it cured the first patient who actually had an acute myeloid leukemia. She got a bone marrow transplant because that myeloid leukemia was refractory. 
Um, and her sickle cell disease and her leukemia uh, were cured by basically replacing the whole genome uh, with, of her bone marrow with that of her sibling. And this is, you know, this is akin to a kidney transplant um, uh, in, in, in the case of um, polycystic kidney disease, where you, you know, you transplant with somebody who doesn't have a genetic predisposition to the disease. Uh, and so it works. And she was at St. Jude uh, advocating for uh, curative therapies. And, um, you know, we have the ability to think about curing diseases because we can take the bone marrow out and put it back. So hematopoietic stem cells make all of the blood elements, granulocytes, lymphocytes, uh, and platelets, but also red cells. So if we can either replace or repair the hematopoietic stem cell, then we should be able to fix this disease. And given that it's a single gene defect and we can take the organ out and put it back, that puts us at a distinct advantage when thinking about genetic strategies. So these are how we think about them. We, we have drug treatments after all. I mentioned hydroxyurea, which reactivates fetal hemoglobin, which has anti-sickling properties and can reduce uh, pain episodes. But as I mentioned, we can give somebody else's uh, bone marrow, an allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplant, or we can take the patient's own bone marrow stem cells and either add a copy of a corrective gene that we use retroviruses for, and you heard uh, the last speaker describe that, or we can use CRISPR to either cut or repress or a fetal hemoglobin or correct uh, the genetic defect. But ultimately, we, like everyone, would like to be able to uh, put something in that uh, capsule that uh, she showed us uh, in the in the previous talk and just give to the patient then have it go in and do the work for us. So bone marrow transplant works. This is the first um, uh, trial of using bone marrow transplant in a pediatric population uh, as secondary stroke prophylaxis. Um, this was a standard bone marrow transplant with ablative chemotherapy. Um, it worked most of the time, established that you can cure the disease. We got better over time in a, in a French trial, we could see with just the simple addition of ATG to the conditioning regimen, the rejection rate went from almost a quarter to only 3%. And, you know, we got better in supporting bone marrow transplant recipients such that after uh, January 2000, the cure rate for kids was over 95%. And so that said that if you have a matched sibling in the family and you're, a, you know, a kid with sickle cell disease at risk or having had a stroke, you should you should get a bone marrow transplant because this works, you know, the vast majority of the time. Mark Walters then followed up on that original transplant uh, uh, protocol that I that I showed you and um, made a really interesting observation, and that is that you didn't have to completely replace the bone marrow of the recipient with that of donor. They had patients who had a mixture, and this was mostly because we were given oral busulfan during that time and. With the nausea that ensues, some patients would would um, have vomiting, and we would literally have to count the pills and redose them. And some of them didn't get fully ablative. And even with only eleven percent of their white cells from donor, uh, these patients had no further sickle events. They had a normal hemoglobin of donor type and no graft versus host disease, which is the biggest complication. So that made us wonder: Can we do this on purpose? That is, avoid toxic conditioning and graft-versus-host disease by intentionally trying to, to, to make a state of uh, mixed chimerism. So we developed a chemotherapy-free regimen in adults with sickle cell disease who are ineligible for a conventional transplant because of end organ damage. Most adults have you know, bad liver, bad kidney, bad lungs, bad heart, so they don't um, uh, meet uh, inclusion criteria, or they meet, sorry, exclusion criteria for a bone marrow transplant. And so we did this with uh, low-dose TBI, CAMPATH, and oral serolimus, uh, rapamycin, after having shown um, both in, in mouse models and in human cells in vitro the this ability to um, provide for T-cell tolerance. And it worked in nine of the first 10, and then 90% of the First 30, um, we were able to do this without graft-versus-host disease, and we were able to wean off uh, serolimus by one year in the vast majority of patients. And this shows the normalization of the hemoglobin uh, uh, and, um, and uh, markers of hemolysis. And here you can see the myeloid chimerism in the top 
panel um, CD1415 and the lymphoid chimerism uh, in the lower line in the in the top left, showing you know the vast majority of cells coming from donor. Uh, and um, we then went on to look at how we were doing in 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 the US over the ensuing decade after introducing this work. And you can see that um, even with alternative donors um, in in uh, uh, in the lower lines, uh, we're getting better, uh, even with haplo matching. So only half of the graph matching. But again, the best results being when you have a tissue matching sibling uh, shown in the blue line here, greater than 95% overall uh, and event-free. Uh, survival. So then we got to answer the question that was posed in the last uh, talk, how much do we need to fix? Because we had now over 100 patients that we transplanted, many of them in long-term follow-up. We had closely followed myeloid chimerism, which tracks with bone marrow stem cell chimerism. And we identified three patients who, despite having very good results initially, <coughs> excuse me, had uh, falling levels of chimerism. They all had trait donors, so they had a little less than 50% hemoglobin S because of the carrier state uh, in their donor. All three of them developed a rise in the sickle hemoglobin above 50% and recurrent symptoms when their donor myeloid chimerism fell below 50. And we modeled this mathematically to ask the question, is that just because of differences in lifespan between the donor and the recipient cells. And in red, you can see the observed data and in blue, that predicted by the formula on the left, taking into account only lifespan. So that tells us we need to fix one in five cells because the lifespan of the fixed cell is so much better uh, that it uh, over you know populates the periphery such that all of the cells are coming from donor. So then the question is, can we do that with a gene addition gene therapy vector? Uh, and for this, we use integrating vectors, as was mentioned previously, because we want all the daughter cells to carry whatever gene we put in. And so we use a, you know, a, a, a retrovirus uh, to put the beta globin gene in, and that acts as a Trojan horse, uh, bringing that genetic <clears throat> material to the hematopoietic stem cell. And when I started in the lab, this was pretty easy to do in the 90s. We could do this in mice, get really high levels in vivo for the life of the mouse over 50%, certainly enough. Um, and we had equally high gene transfer rates estimated by in vitro assays of human hematopoietic uh, stem cells. And this is uh, Steve Rosenberg's paper that was mentioned earlier, the first gene transfer in humans. We, we had other attempts in patients getting <clears throat> autologous transplants for multiple myeloma. And what we saw was very low levels of gene transfer that was only transient. So this is a, a highly sensitive nested PCR assay with sensitivity down to 0.01%. And you can see intermittent bands in the patient at very low levels, like one in 100,000. So the first lesson is that we needed a predictive uh, human hematopoietic stem cell assay. Uh, and in this case, we're using uh, the non-human primate as a way to um, uh, de-risk this. And most of the effort in the lab has been spent going back to the drawing board because so much that works in the mouse doesn't work in the non-human primate. And, and furthermore, what works in the non-human primate uh, seems to work in human clinical trials. So we had a big breakthrough uh, in the vector field when lentiviral vectors were shown to be able to transfer all the bells and whistles needed for uh, the hemoglobinopathies. Um, this is Michel Satterling's work and then later Philippe Labou showing that you can correct both thalassemia and two different models of uh, sickle cell disease using an HIV-based lentiviral vector encoding uh, beta globin. We moved to the non-human primate, but you know I told you that this has been a very predictive assay, uh, but unfortunately, old world monkeys are resistant to HIV infection and therefore HIV transduction. So we had to make a chimeric vector with the simian immunodeficiency capsid because we discovered that TRIM5-alpha was targeting this capsid when there was a species mismatch. And this vector works really quite well uh, in this model and um, could help us to, to model using HIV-1 based vectors uh, in the non-human primate. And we made uh, 
vectors expressing beta globin or a GFP on beta globin promoter. And we could we could get now reliably above 20%, uh, even with only half of the product when doing this in a competitive repopulation assay. So we have large animal model now telling us um, that, that we're at the threshold that we need to fix the disease. And this just shows that this is a, a peripheral smear that I just made and stuck under the fluorescent microscope uh, after a transplant with a, a beta globin um, promoter uh, driven GFP as a reporter uh, in these red cells, you can see quite nice GFP. We then showed that steady state bone marrow was as good as peripheral blood because we can't use a GCSF to mobilize a peripheral blood uh, as we do in all other diseases. So it looks like bone marrow is fine. We looked at steady state bone marrow in patients and we found the CD34 cells that we transduce uh, to be abundant in the marrow of patients with sickle cell disease. So that told us, you know, that's that's fine. We, we have enough cells, uh, the bone marrow is okay. We did dosing studies to see whether we needed to really push to get rid of the patient's bone marrow when we're doing gene transfer, because we wanna give all advantage to cells that we give. And it turns out in the mouse, you know, the more conditioning you give, the better engraftment you get. The same is true in the monkey. The more conditioning you give, the better engraftment you give, you get. And, you know, if you really want the 20% mark, you need to ablate. So we started this HTB206 study looking at lentiviral vector gene transfer in patients where we, you know, we collect um, either in group A, the bone marrow, uh, in group B, we refined the transduction methods to get better uh, transduction. And in group C, we moved to um, mobilized peripheral blood with a new agent, plorexifor, in an attempt to get a better cell dose. These cells are then sent to a central manufacturing, the patient gets busulfan ablation and then gets the cells back. And then hopefully we get reconstitution in a way that fixes the disease. Well, in group A, we had only modest uh, benefit. And in pink here, you can see the amount of globin coming from the vector. We can measure this by HPLC. Uh, and it's only a gram or two. And the hemoglobin only improved by about a gram. And despite the peripheral blood marking, this is vector copy number. So this is the average number of vector per cell. Uh, it's about 0.1. So that means that about 10% of cells have one copy. That wasn't enough to fix the disease. So we went back and looked at the marrow and found that the CD34 fraction was actually uh, much more differentiated. You can see non-sickle marrow, very high CD34 uh, percentage in sickle marrow, only about half uh, CD34 bright. The rest of these were on down the lineage pathway, so uh, no longer stem cells. So we did a mobilization protocol, uh, looked at mobilization in sickle cell disease, and with this agent plorexifor, we could get very good mobilization within hours, not days like it takes with GCSF, and we could get much higher doses, 5 million CD34s per kg, our goal being three, uh, with a single apheresis, and these were CD34 bright, so they look like real stem cells as shown here in the bottom uh, left panel. The same was true uh, at, when we started doing this on the Bluebird trial as backup, and we found that grade three adverse events were less common with mobilization than they were with, um, with, uh, with a bone marrow harvest. So patients were having more pain actually with the bone marrow harvest. So we got more cells with less mischief. We got better at transducing the cells. So now using you know, a cocktail of transduction enhancers, we can get, um, as shown in the bottom left here, the vast majority of cells with the gene, GFP marker gene here, uh, with good vector copy numbers. So uh, we moved on to group C, and these have now been published. And here you can see a contrast between groups A and C. Group A having this 0.1 vector copy number, again, 10% with one copy. Group C having 1.45 as a median vector copy number uh, over time. So that means that all cells have at least one copy uh, of the gene. Here we can now see the hemoglobins in those patients over time. So again, modest uh, in group A, about 10% of the hemoglobin coming uh, from vector and about a one gram bump in the total hemoglobin over time. But on the right panel, you can see nearly half of the hemoglobin 
uh, coming from vector uh, and full normalization of the total hemoglobin uh, over time. That's associated with a complete resolution of severe vaso-occlusive events. So these severe vaso-occlusive events are when patients are coming in uh, with severe pain uh, requiring um, hospitalization and IV narcotics. Uh, that was very frequent as shown in blue uh, in the two months prior to informed consent, I mean, two years, sorry, prior to informed consent uh, and absent uh, post-infusion. That compares very well to our experience, uh, Dr. Rampa, uh, in, in patients receiving allogeneic transplants, both um, at the NIH and at Children's National. Uh, you can see the number of events in blue uh, on the left-hand side, uh, uh, even more than 50 in some patients. Uh, and in the first year in yellow, so some pain events, uh, actually more than we saw in the gene therapy trial in the first year and in red in the second year. year. So I can summarize by saying that, you know, we can do transplants now. Um, allogeneic being whole genome therapy is curative for patients with sickle cell disease. We have gene therapy now with gene addition working. Um, gene editing is also working. Uh, and in fact, there is a um, CRISPR vertex uh, trial testing cutting the BCL11A erythroid enhancer, which is a repressor of fetal hemoglobin. So that allows reactivation of fetal hemoglobin. And that those data look also quite good with resolution of pain events uh, afterwards. And in both this gene addition strategy and gene editing strategy have had BLAs um, uh, this year and we're um, expecting a decision by the FDA in December about approval of these um, two, uh, two um, uh, strategies. Uh, we have toxicities, I didn't have much time to talk about toxicities, but you know, toxicity of, of conditioning remains a, a, a difficulty, you know, this busulfan makes patients infertile. Uh, there are um, descriptions of MDS um, after autologous transplants and allotransplants for sickle cells. So we need novel ways to get these graphs in that aren't so toxic. And as I mentioned before, we really need methods to deliver these tools uh, in vivo, such as, you know, lipid nanoparticles that can bring, um, CRISPR to the to the bone marrow. So I'll acknowledge the the team and and take any questions. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kirstel. That was that was a lot that you covered. Uh, well, um, I have a quick question for you. Uh, you spoke about increasing fetal hemoglobin as a therapy. Do you think that would affect how oxygen is carried in an adult in adult tissues? So, I mean, we have other ways of compensating. So 2,3-DPG can come in and compensate when you have most or all fetal hemoglobin. And in fact, I have a, a patient, uh, a thalassemia patient that we follow here that has a hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. All of her hemoglobin is fetal uh, and she's fine. Um, and she's carried two pregnancies even. So I, I don't think there's any downside really to having... Uh, you know, fetal hemoglobin be most or all uh, of the of the hemoglobin. Interesting. Um, I'm looking for some questions. I have a question, Dr. Tisdale. Um, similar to the first speaker, where they talked about um, an antibody response to the um, to the to the gene, a delivered gene in patients that had had a deletion. Uh, have you seen an antibody response to the normal? Um, hemoglobin gene that's coming from the donor, uh, specifically like anti-hemoglobin antibodies? We haven't. Um, and that may relate to the fact that sickle and beta differ by only one amino acid. So um, it's not like they haven't seen beta globin. They've just seen a different one um, that's probably not immunogenic because we haven't, we haven't seen this. And when we've expressed, you know, human beta globin in monkeys, for example, we we don't see uh, immunologic rejection or even hemoglobin S uh, in monkeys. So I think we're, we're, we're lucky in that way as well. 
we have a question in the chat. Uh, you showed a potential survival advantage of edited uh, or transplanted cells. Does that translate into higher risks of uh, myeloproliferative diseases later? No, because the um, the advantage is uh, after ejection of the nucleus from the red cell. So the advantage is purely based on longer lifespan of the of the red cell. Uh, so that, you know, that, that advantage occurs not in the marrow, not in, in nucleated cells, but in non-nucleated cells in the periphery. Uh -huh. There, you know, there still may be risk for, for MDS, AML in this disease. It's, you know, there is an underlying risk and there's also a risk when you've perturbed hematopoiesis through a transplant. So that's, you know, that is a risk that we're having to deal with. Look, another question is, has the cost of these therapies been an issue for insurance coverage? Two minutes. Well, it hasn't made it yet to uh, insurance companies, but, um, you know, it's going to be a similar price tag to the gene therapies that you saw in the last talk. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's going to be equally difficult to access because of that high cost. We're hopeful that we can bring that cost down. Uh, we've, you know, made our own efforts at, for example, making vector production um, much more robust, and that's the biggest cost. Uh, we have a vector system that's about tenfold better uh, than the current vector system that, you know, theoretically could bring the cost down tenfold. We're looking for more questions. Um, I have a question, one more question for you. That is, um, do you think uh, editing stem cells outside and then transplanting them in the body, uh, is this method of you know uh, therapy much better than directly infusing vectors either to deliver or edit cells? Well, I think in terms of um, rollout, it's going to be much better to be able to directly infuse some sort of editor, be that a lipid nanoparticle or a vector, a driven editor uh, than to take the cells out and put them back. Because, you know, when you take the cells out and put them back, that means you have to do a transplant. That means a patient comes in, you ablate their marrow, you know, you wait around for recovery after you infuse. That's about a month process, blood transfusions, antibiotics for, you know, in infections that occur when the neutrophils are gone. So, you know, it's not trivial. Um, but if we had an in vivo delivery system that could do all of that, um, without a transplant, I think that would be a much uh, more viable option. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tisdale. I think that's all the time we have for the questions. Dr. Bola, did you want to take over? Yes, um, thank you. Um, my name is Vivek Bhalla. I'm a faculty member at Stanford University, and I wanted to thank the organizers for allowing me to be part of this wonderful session and to co-moderate with Anubhav. Um, I want to thank our prior two speakers, Dr. Leck and Dr. Tisdale, um, and I'm proud um, and honored to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Matt Wilson, who's a professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He's a physician scientist and nephrologist whose current research is focused on developing cell and gene therapy for kidney disease. And the title of his talk is Targeting the Kidneys with Gene Therapy. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Bala and the organizers for the opportunity to present some of our work today. So I'm going to talk about the Need for gene therapy for kidney disease, considerations for gene delivery of the kidney, um, targeting cystinuria, which is our disease of choice. So this is not a PKD talk, but I think it's more of a food for thought for gene therapy for PKD, and then talk about technologies and approaches. <clears throat> so in our lab, we um, focus on the kidney at an intersection of human kidney pathophysiology genome engineering, cell therapy, and gene therapy. <clears throat> in genome engineering, we're trying to improve genome engineering technologies, <clears throat> and we're also developing some new AAV capsids to target the kidney. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, in cell therapy, we're interested in um, treating uh, complications of kidney disease or uh, like enzyme deficiencies that affect the kidney. And then for gene therapy, we're primarily interested in the proximal tubule and trying to correct cystinuria. <clears throat> so you all know that there are many um, genetic diseases of the kidney, um, of which PKD is one of those. So there's no shortage of, of targets for gene therapy in the kidney disease realm. And we know that 
about 30% of patients with kidney disease have some underlying monogenetic component to their disease. And when we look at the <clears throat> approved uh, cell and gene therapies worldwide, um, you know, there's lots of different vectors, including A, B, um, lentiviral vectors, uh, CAR T cells, which are modified with lentiviral retroviral vectors. Um, but most of these target cancer. <clears throat> and what you can see from, with a few monogenic diseases, what you can see from this diagram here is that none of them uh, target the kidney. Um, and so when we think about, <clears throat> you know, is it possible to do gene transfer for therapy of kidney disease? The idea is you have some cells and you do some gene transfer to affect chronic kidney disease or some complication. So pictorially, that would be you have a healthy kidney that progresses over time. You know, in the case of your field, a cystic kidney, and could you do some kind of gene transfer to prevent the progression of, of that kidney disease? And the reason that the kidney um, field has lagged behind uh, muscular gene delivery or hematopoietic stem cell uh, gene delivery is because of delivery to the kidney itself. That's the, been the main issue in the field. So considerations for gene delivery to the kidney, <clears throat> there's a lot of um, different things to consider, including, including the size of the particle, whether or not you want to deliver DNA, RNA, or possibly protein, uh, the genome size, whether or not you can manipulate um, the capsid of the virus or uh, nanoparticles to target the kidney immune response, um, and then whether or not you want integration into the genome. For instance, if you're um, manipulating a uh, dividing cell population, you're probably going to want um, integration. But one of the things I want to point out in this diagram is that, for instance, AV, which is um, probably the most widely used um, virus for gene therapy approaches, um, its size would be larger than that would be normally filtered by the glomerulus. So um, there, you have to think about other ways to get AV other than just from the bloodstream side into the kidney. So we've, um, I've been accused of being hard-headed or possibly stupid for <laughs> going down this realm uh, many years ago, but we, we've we persisted and there's a lot of different delivery methods we've tried over the years. Um, we started out using an ultrasound microbubble approach where you use uh, ultrasound to burst uh, microbubbles that cause holes in cells and can deliver genes into tissues. And we could never really get that to work in the kidney um, although um, people may have refined that and they may be able to start working again now. Um, <clears throat> in mice, there's a procedure called hydrodynamic telvein injection where you do a high pressure, uh, high volume injection to the telvein and it transfects the liver of mice with plasma DNA. However, in the kidney, it's about a thousand fold less delivery of genes to the kidney. So it's not very efficient. Over the years, we've tried a lot of different nanoparticles. Um, that haven't worked uh, primarily because people will make nanoparticles that can be loaded with siRNA or fluorescent dyes and show they can go to the kidney. But in our case, when we've tried to put DNA in them, it, it alters the packaging somehow and they don't work well. Um, <clears throat> there is a person, um, Ryan Williams, uh, in New York that's developed these mesoscale nanoparticles that do seem to work for a lot of different things. Um, again, we tried those with DNA and couldn't get them to work, but uh, that doesn't mean that you couldn't use them to deliver like CRISPR RMPs or something like that. And those have been shown to target proximal tubular cells. And then the last three here, I'm going to um, show some data in the talk. Um, hydrodynamic injection into the kidney directly with a non-viral approach, hybrid um, AAV transposon approaches, and then AAV um, novel capsids at the end. <clears throat> so our lab... Um, other than in being interested in the kidney, has been working on transposons um, since the beginning of my uh, independent investigator career. And the primary one we use is called piggyback. And the way piggyback works is uh, transposase called piggyback is expressed, and it cuts a transposon that's flanked by these terminal ember repeatomates out of a plasmid and then integrates it into the genome. And <clears throat> this is an example of just uh, transfecting culture cells with a antibiotic resistance cassette and then selecting those cells over time. And this would be the traditional plasma transfection way. And when you use piggyback, you can see that you get much more cells with integration shown here staying with methylene blue. So it's very efficient at integrating transgenic cargo. <clears throat> so we developed um, 
a hydrodynamic uh, renal pelvis injection method in mice where we could deliver a uh, plasmid, uh, transposon plasmid expressing luciferase in this example, uh, reproducibly um, to the targeted kidney and it would go nowhere else in the mouse. And we got a lot better um, morbidity and mortality with this method as opposed to trying to inve inject the renal vein in mice. So we proceeded with that approach. And <clears throat> we tried different promoters um, to see where we could get expression and we compared uh, the CMB promoter, TF1 alpha, and gamma GT trying to target proximal tubular cells. And what we found was when we co stained for RBAT, which is a cysteine transporter expressed in proximal tubular cells, the CMB promoter gave expression in what looked like peritubular fibroblasts. However, EF1 alpha and gamma GT showed expression in proximal tubular cells. So we proceeded with those to try to engineer an approach for cystinuria. So cystinuria is an autosomal recessive disease that affects about one in 15,000 in the U.S. It's a mutation of a heteromeric amino acid transporter involving two genes. You can have mutation in either one of these genes leading to the, the defect. And these two proteins come together and heterodimerize with the RBAP protein shown here in fuchsia and the other protein in blue through the cysteine bridge. And these two proteins are needed together on the plasma membrane to transport cysteine uh, as well as the cola amino acids, uh, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. It's called cystinuria because cystine is the one that crystallizes in the urine and causes the, the phenotype, not the other amino acids. <clears throat> so the pathophysiology of cystinuria is that in the proximal tubule, you have this heteromeric amino acid transporter that reabsorbs cysteine from the urine. And when you have mutation in one of those, I'm showing SLC3A1 here, um, you don't get delivery of the transporter to the plasma membrane. You're not able to reabsorb cysteine. It crystallizes in the urine and causes stones obstruction and chronic kidney disease over time. So these patients um, have these pathognomonic hexagonal cysteine crystals in the urine. They have frequent pain infections, obstructive uropathy. Males are affected more than females. They have frequent surgical procedures. 70% um, can develop CKD. And ultimately, the treatments, there's things you can do that treat um, stone formers in general. And then there's various drugs that have been tried for cystinuria, but overall, they have poor efficacy. And a lot of these patients um, suffer quite a bit. So there's several patients interested in, in eventual gene therapy. So why a gene-based approach? Again, current treatments are lacking. It's a single gene disorder. It's a model for future therapies of more complex diseases. Um, as I pointed out at the beginning, gene transfer of the kidney remains understudied. <clears throat> and overall, the idea here is if you can get the cysteine concentration in the urine less than one millimolar, you can move crystallization of cysteine to solubility. So if we can get even a low level of transporter expression, we could move patients from crystallization to solubility and dramatically affect their phenotype. And we believe for cystinuria that could actually be achieved by um, getting just a few of the cells to actually express the transporter, not all of them, which, you know, means there's a low level for a gene delivery efficiency for this disease, as opposed to something like polycystic kidney disease, which I think is going to require a high level of, of transduction efficiency. So for vector choice, we've tried transposons, again, hybrid AV transposons, and then novel capsids. So the first thing we did was our mouse model involves a mutation of SLC3A1, so we made a transposon that expressed SLC3A1 or RBAT, the basic amino acid transporter, and confirmed expression in heterologous cells. And then when we co-transfect SLC3A1 and 7A9 to make this heteromeric amino acid transporter, we can see FITSI cysteine uptake in cells, so that confirms that our, our transgene is functional. And then we have a cystinuria mouse models that we generated with CRISPR-Cas that have elevated cysteine in the urine measured by mass spec for both males and females. They have the pathognomonic hexagonal cysteine crystals. And then we can use x-ray to look at stone formation over time. So mice develop bladder stones um, as opposed to kidney stones. Humans develop bladder stones as well. But um, we can just use x-ray to quantitate the stone formation over time uh, in mice pretty easily. So the first thing we did was we injected our SLC3A1 expressing transposon into mice um, using hydrodynamic renal pelvis injection. 
So this is expression of our bat in wild type mice and in knockout mice, there's no expression. With our SLC3A1 gene transfer, we did see some patchy areas of expression of our bat. And then when we looked at cysteine levels in the urine, we were able to reduce uh, the cysteine levels in the urine to about half, but we could not get them lower than the crystallization threshold. So when we looked at stone formation over time, we didn't see a statistically significant difference between uh, naive animals and those treated with our transposon approach. So we got partial correction of cystinuria because we were able to reduce the cysteine levels, but we were not able to affect overall stone formation over time. So we needed to adapt our approach and see if we could do other things to try to improve delivery. So the first thing we tried was a hybrid a piggyback um, AV vectors to enhance gene delivery. And uh, one of the previous uh, speakers spoke quite a bit about AV, so I'm going to skip this. However, I do want to point out that although AAV does have broad host strains, the actual delivery to the kidney is quite limited for the naturally occurring serotypes of AAV. And <clears throat> the way you create AAV is you um, replace the rep and cap genes of AAV with your transgene and promoter of interest, and then you do a triple transfection with your transgene flanked by the ITRs with the rep and cap genes and adenovirus helper genes, and then you can purify and capsidate AV. So we wondered, you know, can we increase AV gene delivery, in this case, this is AV9, uh, to the kidney by doing a targeted injection of the kidney as opposed to a telvein injection, a systemic injection. And what we found is when we did renal pelvis injection, we could get increased expression of luciferase transgene in the kidney However, um, and we can see that quantitated here, however, we still did get off-target expression in the liver. So if you inject AAV in the kidney through the renal pelvis, it is still possible for it to get out into the bloodstream and get to other organs. But we can enhance kidney-specific uh, gene delivery through targeted kidney injection. However, when we looked at uh, transient expression, this is looking at GFP, you can see there's a whole bunch of cells here, but very few of them are green. Um, the transduction efficiency uh, remained low with our targeted kidney injection method. So the next thing we tried was, there is some evidence that long-term expression from AAV is mediated at least in part by integration of AAV, which is not common, but does occur. So we wondered if we could package piggyback within AAV and improve integration of our transgene, could we get better long-term expression? So in these experiments, <clears throat> we have one AV carrying our transgene flanked by the piggyback ITRs within the AV ITRs. And then we're supplying another AV with the transposase with the goal of our transgene then being integrated into the genome after AV delivers it to the cells. And what we found was when we used our hybrid AV piggyback approach and we quantitated uh, gene expression over time using in vivo imaging, we saw increased expression over time with piggyback than without. And when we took out the kidneys and looked at luciferase imaging, we saw the best uh, transgene expression that we had seen with any delivery method that we had tried so far. So we wanted to use this approach to then see if we could correct cystinuria. <clears throat> and so what we did was, again, this is AV9, uh, we delivered a uh, luciferase transgene with piggyback and compared that to SLC3A1 delivery with piggyback and looked at stone formation over time using x-rays. And our hybrid um, AV piggyback approach was able to reduce uh, stone formation over time. Uh, but again, when we look at, I don't have a picture of this, but when we look at the number of cells actually expressing, it's still actually quite low. So we think that Again, we don't need a high level number of cells expressing or that the actual level of expression in the cells is so low that we can't reliably pick it up with immunofluorescence microscopy. When we did look at the transgene, again, this is um, looking at 52 weeks post gene transfer. We can do PCR where we can differentiate between our transgene to that of the endogenous gene by the size um, because the, a transgene doesn't have um, introns. We can see that we can pick up the um, transgene in the kidney 
in mice injected with our SLC3A1 transgene, but not with luciferase. And again, you do see a lot of transgene in the liver, again, because the AAV is able to get out of the kidney and infect other organs. So the last thing I want to talk about is novel um, AAV capsids that uh, can deliver genes to the kidney. And this is one such capsid called CC47 that was discovered uh, from the Asakin lab in this published publication here. And in this um, publication, they were not trying to develop capsids to deliver genes to the kidney. <laughs> they were trying to develop capsids uh, to enhance neuromuscular transduction. It just happened that, so that this capsid uh, transduces the kidney very well. So here I'm showing a whole kidney slice um, with scanning uh, microscopy with M. cherry showing delivery um, to a lot of the OAT1 positive um, proximal tubular cells. So this was a self-complementary AAV. And I want to point out that there's two different types of AAV. There's single-stranded AAV, which has a packaging capacity of 4.7 kilobases. And then there's self-complementary AAV, which has the DNA folded back on itself and has packaging capacity of about half. So in this picture, this is self-complementary AV. So the first thing we did was, in order for our RBAT transgene to fit, we need to use single-stranded AV. So we use the CC47 capsid to deliver our transgene, and we saw no expression. Um, and this can happen in the AV field when you have a capsid that works well for self-complementary, if you then go to single-stranded, it may not work as well. Too so we wanted to know, um, does our um, capsid actually, does our AAV actually express? And so um, in heterologous cells, we did confirm high mRNA levels of SLC3A1. So again, it expresses well, but when we delivered it in vivo, we saw no expression of SLC3A1. So we needed to adapt our approach, and what we decided to do was to use uh, this transplicing approach. So in the previous talk, they talked about intines. This is another way of doing that, where you use uh, uh, area of homologous recombination with splice donors and acceptors, where you split your transgene between two AVs, and then it undergoes homologous recombination and transcription and RNA splicing to express your protein. And so the first thing we did was we did this with where we split M cherry instead of SLC3A1 and confirmed that we got good transduction with a dual uh, AVs uh, splicing together to express M cherry in cells. And then <clears throat> we quantitated this again using a scanning microscopy where we compared a full length M cherry in one virus to dual M cherries and we were able to get expression you know, depending on how you set your microscopy settings uh, in about 35% of the cells with the dual AVs, which we think will be more than high enough for us to try to correct a cystinuria. So that's the um, approach that we're proceeding with at this time, in addition to other things that we're trying that I'm not talking about today. So um, that's the, the end of my talk. I wanted to acknowledge um, uh, Jen Peak, an MSTP student who's doing the work with CC47 at the end, uh, Lauren Woodard, who did some of the nonviral work at the beginning, and Tom Beckerman, who did some of the AAV piggyback work, and then other members of the lab uh, that continue to work on this project, and then our collaborators from the Sokin Lab at Duke and, and funding agencies. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. I think there's a few questions in the chat. Um, I'll start with a question um, from Santosh regarding uh, renal pelvis injection. Um, does this uh, relate, does this result in further um, kidney injury uh, when, when done in that manner in the, in the various experiments that you tried? So if you do hydrodynamic renal pelvis injection, it does. Um, in that paper, we show that uh, BUN uh, does go up, um, but it does resolve. So when you do a pressure injection and you're shoving a lot of volume into the kidney, you're gonna get some damage. Um, with renal pelvis injection with AV, we're not doing a hydrodynamic injection. Uh, it's just a small volume, uh, so we don't see damage with that. Got it. Um, and then a question from Dr. Yu, which I think is on uh, many people's minds. Um, you've been looking at proximal tubule, um, and with PKD, there's thought that um, many of the cysts may be derived from collecting duct. Uh, have you found any AVs that would efficiently transduce collecting duct epithelium? Not as of today. 
problem. Um, uh, and then have you measured transduction efficiency at different times with respect to age of the mice? So, um, you know, when you do plasmid injection, um, you see, you know, a high number of expressing cells day two or day three. Um, and then as you get integration, that number decreases over time, but goes to a steady state. Um, with AV, when you look at transfection or transduction, usually we look about a month after injection, um, it's stable. I mean, we haven't gone beyond six months at this point, but it's stable. I wanted to ask one question um, to myself about um, the cystinuria model that you showed, where you showed a significant decrease in the number of stones. So you spoke earlier about this need to try to hit a um, crystallization threshold um, with regard to the urine cysteine that you saw. Were you able to hit that threshold um, in that in that model and then the one that you saw significance? Yeah, so our, our cysteine measurements are ongoing. I don't have the data to show you at this point. Okay, thank you. We were using one method and then um, that person wasn't around anymore. So we had to switch methods and, you know, trying to work that out, so. Fair enough. Um, there is a question about incorporating DNA uh, into nanoparticles and, and um, what experience you've had with that and some of the issues around that. Yeah, so we haven't had a lot of luck with that. Um, you know, again, taking nanoparticles where people have put siRNA or fluorescent dyes and then trying to load them with DNA, um, we don't see equivalent delivery um, or much delivery at all. It doesn't mean that's not going to be the case for every nanoparticle, but for most of the ones um, we've tried, that seems to be the case. Got it. And you also spoke, uh, just a question from Dr. Kwan, you had spoken about um, this idea of using two vectors to try to um, get, um, to take advantage of the self-complementary AAV. Um, do you think that that would work for PKD1 based on its large size, or is, it, is that still too big a gene for, for that system? Um, you know, I think the more, the more pieces you have, the efficiency is going to go down. Um, but uh, there are, there's like, there's a recent um, bio archive report where um, AV, when it goes into cells, it concatenates. Uh, and so, you know, through this antene approach or through transplicing, I do think you can, you can make bigger things. It's just the efficiency decreases the longer, the longer it is. And then, um, Anubo, do you mind asking that question? I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, what I wanted to ask is for larger genes like PKD1, can we use something other than lentiviruses or AAVs? For example, uh, in this case, I've written T4 bacteriophages, which has a huge packaging capacity. Are we thinking on that line, other viruses? Yeah, I mean, I think there's other things out there that could be uh, considered um, the we haven't personally tried those, but I think it's possible. Uh, there is one question, apparently. Uh, if you have tried other roads, such as retrograde uh, ureteral injection. We have. Um, we've done renal pelvis injection and retrograde ureteral injection, and there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in our hands between those two. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I think given the time, um, wanted to once again thank um, my co-moderator and our speakers for a wonderful, wonderfully informative um, and very technologically innovative session today. Um, I believe um, it is time for a lunch break for all of you on the on the East Coast. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the main organizers of the symposium. Thank you. So we'll see um, everybody back in 30 minutes, if that's okay. So that should be 115 on the East Coast, okay? So thank you, everybody. Thank all the speakers, the, the uh, moderators. It was uh, a great session this morning. Thank you so much. <laughs>